Good evening, councillors, uh, officers and members of the public and welcome to this cabinet meeting of Thursday the 30th uh, of November. Uh, as hopefully you all know, this is the first webcast meeting uh, with councillors held, so I've been told after to read the following statement. This meeting is being webcast live to our website and will be available for repeated viewing after the meeting has ended. By continuing to attend this meeting, you are consenting to being filmed and to appearing in the webcast. I'd like to remind all those participating in the meeting to use their microphones when they speak and more importantly, to turn them off once they have finished talking. Otherwise, the camera will remain on you and not on the next person talking. Uh, so on that note, let's get cracking. Um, apologies for absence. I've received apologies for council hardware. Are there any further apologies? No. Declarations of interest. Uh, any members have any declarations to make, uh, Councillor O'Dell? Um, in regards to uh, item 15 of Council Leaseholder, and it references major works bills to Council Leaseholders. Thank you. Thank you. Any further declarations of anyone? Any further leaseholders in the room? Uh, you may need to make a declaration on item 15. Uh, I would also like to declare as a leaseholder. Uh, very good. Uh, there being no further declarations of interest, we move to item four, which is the minutes from the previous meeting, which you have on page four to eleven of the pack. Are they agreed by cabinet? Is an accurate record of the previous meeting? Agreed. Agreed. Very good. Apologies for that. Can I have one more? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, come to item five, matters arising, only matters arising from the minutes of the previous meeting. Councillor Edwards. Uh, I may be doing you a disservice, but I don't think I've received a written update with regard to strawberry star. I know we've had a conversation, but I've not had anything in writing. So. Uh, I'm 95% confident, so I made it my life's ambition to make sure I followed up with all the uh, written things, but I will check after this meeting, make sure I Check sure you've got it, yeah. Any further matters arising from the minutes? No, which brings us to item six for questions from the public. Uh, there are no questions this evening from the public. Uh, which takes us to written questions from councillors. Item seven, uh, we have two questions from councillors this evening, the first of which is from Councillor Chris Vince. Uh, would you like to read the question, Councillor Vince, or take it to it? I will read it. Um, uh, can you give me a full list of warm banks that were provided both by Harlow Council and other organisations to Harlow residents struggling with heating bills during this cost of living crisis? Councillor Sims. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Councillor Vince. Harlow's Playhouse will be providing a warm space and inviting space in the theatres, bar and cafe areas to everyone who needs it throughout winter during its current opening hours of 10 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. Monday to Thursday um, and 10 a.m. till 10.30 Friday and Saturday although we'll be closed for Christmas Day and New Year's Day. In addition, Summers Farm Close will have space available from 8.30 a.m. until 4 p.m. all week whilst Harlow Central Library will be providing a warm space Monday to Friday 9.30, 9 a.m. to 5.30 and Saturday 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Both of these venues are on top of the common rooms at all 22 supported housing schemes around the town. The council has a page on its website dedicated to warm spaces and has issued a press release on Monday that included a call out to groups who are providing them. We have also worked with external organisations who are providing warm spaces, details which can be found on the website. Do have a supplementary council yeah, thank you for your answers and thank you for, for the reassurances. I think my concern would be that um, you know, when warm spaces were processed were published previously, Harlow wasn't listed and I feel that once again we've been a little bit on the back foot on this. So can I just ask, I appreciate that the you know, pressure came out on Monday, but actually the weather was pretty cold on Monday um, and you know, likely to be, um, continue to be cold. So can I just ask that in, in future years we try and be a bit more on the front foot with this and try and actually get um, this information out sooner so that residents know what's going on a little bit sooner. So I feel it was kind of a bit of an 11th hour. Thank you. Have any answer? 
in all fairness, um, when we look across town, there are actually other provisions which have been working together with residents and providing warmer spaces and um, ways and how they can help and support residents with some council support as well, which may not be recorded here. So I think it may not have been published early enough to what you stated, but the work works which are undergoing uh, before the actual announcement. Come down to question two from Councillor Edwards. Would you like to read your question, Councillor Edwards? I would, please. Um, could you please say when the work compiling a list of, of this year's warm spaces commenced and which organisations have been approached? Councillor Seals. Thanks again, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Edwards, for your question. Work compiling list this um, work compliance list, list commenced in October 2023. An organisation approached in complying the list of War Bank included Rainbow Services, St Paul's Church, St Mary's, Heart for Harlow, the Libraries, Morbury Centres, and Streets to Homes. Um, any further questions? Uh, supplementary round, Councillor? Yes, please. Well, can you tell me then why, in the beginning of November, um, well, 7th of November, um, when uh, BBC Essex and your Harlow put out a list of warm banks across the town, um, our list wasn't there. And in fact, um, what was what was on the uh, council uh, website at that date was completely out of date. It related to the previous year's provision of warm bank services. There had been no attempt whatsoever as of the 7th of November to update the, uh, the website. Subsequently, work has been done, which is great. So I just wanted to, my question is, um, my question therefore is, is when we, when we put up uh, information on websites, can we, also, can we ensure that the websites are up to date? And when, when the activity is finished, can we ensure that the information is taken down? Councillor Seals. Thank you, and um, that's a feedback that I would um, take on board. Um, however, there has been quite a lot of information which has been featuring on various websites such as um, the Discover Harlow, and again, as my previous reply, there have been loads of actual um, ongoing works which are happening across town in providing warmer spaces. So if it may not have been listed in your Harlow or um, BBC at the time, but they are actual activities which can prove that these activities are actually in preparation as with council support. Very good. Uh, which takes us to item eight, communications from the leader. Uh, and I have a number of communications to make to cabinet since the previous meeting and as we look forward to Christmas. Uh, so I'm afraid you'll have to bear with me whilst I get through them. We continue to make significant progress on each of our five priorities this year. On fixing council housing, over 75% of the repairs backlog has now been cleared. The average wait time for a repair is down from nine months to two months. Void turnarounds are down from 60 days on the 1st of June to 20 days now. Tenancy audits continue week on week. The stock condition survey continues at pace. And all members now have the opportunity to respond to the consultation on the most radical overhauling of our housing allocations policy in decades, which seeks to address some historic injustices, ensuring local homes are for local families and that they go to those most in need, and I would encourage all members to do so. On our second priority, to restore pride in Harlow, we now have completed the audit of the 3,000 street name signs, with Cabinet asked to approve the funding tonight to replace over 2,000 broken, faded, worn and outdated signs across the town. This includes the restoration of blue and white gibbon neighbourhood signs from the 1960s. Our improved winter programme of landscape maintenance is rolling out with an over 140 new neighbourhood parking spaces in phase one of our garage demolition scheme are being created with phase two following shortly. We have now completed the refreshing and replanting of six supported housing schemes, works to totally flatten and replant uh, and restore the infamous Edinburgh Way roundabout jungle start tomorrow evening and every single day hundreds of jobs are being carried out to tackle issues in every street in Harlow. When it comes to priority three of rebuilding our town, week by week more council house building schemes go on site. Now I know in particular the opposition will welcome the developments underway at the former Lister House site, Parnell Road, Arkwrights, the Yorks, 
Pod Street Neighbourhood Office, Elm Hatch, Sherrard's House, The Staple Tire Depot, Woodley's Pitfield and Lower Meadow. Town Centre schemes follow too, uh, and despite the lack of attendance at the member briefing last night on the Town Centre developments, they are continuing at pace and 2024 will be the year in which Harlow Town Centre is a construction site. On Priority 4, securing investment into Harlow, KO Data have now opened their second world-leading data centre here in Harlow, which is putting our town on the map as an AI data leader in the UK. Just next door, the Innovation Park Cabinet will this evening, I hope, approve £2 million further investment to clear the spoil, fit out the new cafe, landscape the whole of the site in advancement of two major investments to be announced in the new year. And when it comes to priority five of improving council services, our call wait times and service standards fall week by week. We have a fantastic new chair and interim MD of HTS in place, which is already bearing fruits. We have announced plans for the transformation of the museum too. In other news, HTS have been out over the last few days keeping things moving in the extreme weather uh, we are experiencing and above all else the most captivating news for cabinet this evening. This week we had the LGA corporate peer challenge follow-up visit from their review in March and I'd like to put on record my sincere thanks for the corporate and democratic services manager and that whole team for the seamless operation that they made of that visit and sincerely I would like to thank everyone uh, every member and every officer of this authority for the work that you have done over the past eight months which has resulted in the most remarkable feedback possible from the LGA. Their message was clear. This council has changed and they would now like to use this as a case study for the country. So I would say where Harlow goes, the country follows. Which takes us now to which item now, I believe, uh, which is petitions of which there are none. Uh, item 10, recent relevant decisions taken by the leader, deputy or portfolio holder, uh, which are to note, uh, 10A had no option for calling and 10B was not called in, so I propose just to note these. Are they noted by cabinet? Indeed. Which takes us to item 11, uh, the corporate plan, which is on page 16 to 36 of your packs. Uh, I'll be proposing this item to Council Leopard in the second day. Uh, before coming to the item, I'd like to propose a further recommendation to the report, uh, which gives delegated authority uh, to the Chief Executive and myself to make minor uh, changes to the document um, moving forward. Um, and I need a seconder for that proposal. Council Leopard seconding that, so we'll add that uh, to the report. Moving to the issue at hand. This is the main strategic document for the Council for the next four years. It sets out six missions uh, which I believe will change this town for the better. Six missions that will change the organisation for the better and ensure that the people we serve uh, feel the utmost benefits of the work that we do. And I believe very passionately that um, what we have shown this year is that having clear direction and clear priorities uh, delivers an enormous amount for the town. And the six missions we've set out are built on the success of those five priorities this year. But above all else, this is a document that is rooted in evidence. It is the evidence that has led to the decision. Probably more similar views than you think on local government financing, but that is not the only factor that causes it. And the government giving us a bigger than you know larger settlement this year won't solve, won't solve our problems. It will help, but it won't solve them. Um, and fundamentally, we're going to have to look at doing some things differently. Councillor Lepard, do you want to have time? Yes. Um, as, as we've said, this one point seven is a projection based on, in part, uh, an unknown that will be known in December. So that will have an impact. However, um, to close the gap, whatever it remains, there are some glaringly obvious ones that we're working on, which I can't discuss at this stage here. But I can assure you um, they will have a, a serious impact, a positive one. And going back to the sponsorships, which we're now seeing with the roundabouts, when we look at other authorities, including these peers, not one of them offers the range of services, that's discretionary services, that we do. We want to, that, yeah, we treasure those services. We want to protect them. And, you know, 
obvious thing is to say, oh, let's charge people to go to the museum or Pitt's Corner. No, we're not going to do that. It's never been under that consideration. Nevertheless, those services cost us net, including the playhouse, about 1.5 million a year in round numbers. Now, whatever I can get sponsoring from sponsors, and I think I can do reasonably well, that will, you know, that 1.5 suddenly diminishes. And at the same time, we are enhancing the protection of those services. And I think, I would like to think that would have cross-party support. Thank you. I think it is worth noting, you know, you said it's not all about the government itself, but it is worth noting that there's a graph there that says that previously the government grant was 50% of our income and it's now 72 so I think it really highlights the, the, the strength of the challenge. There's two more questions from me, Chair, we'd be pleased to know. First one is about earmark reserve. Is the financial officer and portfolio holder satisfied with the reserve? And it's a little bit of a difficult question, but it's more of a dig at your predecessor, Chair. Um, uh, you know, if the council wants to give away another, um, I've called it a sweet enough, I can't think of a better word, um, to the people of Harlow, £50, would this come out of reserve and would the reserve still be in a healthy position in the view of the finance officer and the portfolio holder? Uh, I would draw your attention to the budget pack uh, and the section 151 officer's uh, statement on the budget uh, as to whether he is comfortable with a level of reserves. Um, but as I said, there's a, a, a reserve review ongoing at the moment, which has been reported um, at budget time and the use of some of the reserves. And if you look at the table um, in part four, which sets out the reserves, there's probably some there which you think they uh, are they are they truly required, or could that money be better used um, elsewhere? Uh, I, I have never thought that a tax cut for hard working people is a sweetie. Uh, I think it's the right thing to do if you can possibly afford it. Um, whether we can afford it is a different matter. Um, yeah. uh, Councillor Carter and then Councillor. Oh, sorry, apologies. Yeah. We know, as you mentioned earlier, there's government legislation coming in which is calling for a raise in, in standards, including uh, of you know rent accommodation, including council homes. And I think actually we can all recognise why that is. Um, but do we know what impact that will have on the HRA? And bear in mind, you know, I was on the same training course as Councillor Carter was, and then Councillor Morrison it was last week, wasn't it? Um, bear in mind, we expect no additional funding from government um, um, for this. Comment and see if Councillor Carter wants to add anything. Um, one thing we know for certain is it's going to have a significant effect um, on our financial position. Frankly, we will be asked to do things we've never been asked to do before. Um, you know, and that costs money. Um, it's also the case that, as I said earlier, we're carrying out stock conditions at the moment, and that is going to help throw up a whole load of things that we don't currently know about and problems that are going to uh, cost money to fix. So. You know, housing finance over the coming years is going to be an enormous challenge and how we manage that. What I would say is we are in a stronger position than it may appear. Uh, having cleared the backlog this year, uh, as I think we will by the end of the financial year, that puts us in a far greater position. Later on in the agenda we've got um, an item about major works, you know, that will be the biggest package of things we can do. But like Councillor Edward said earlier, some of the challenges around uh, the, the, the Act talks about as well about uh, energy efficiency of homes and requirements placed on us to do that are enormous uh, in terms of the resource required. Um, but Councillor Carter highlighted some of the scale of what we're talking about. We spent over £100 million pounds this year uh, on our council housing stock in one way or another. Uh, and you know, the, the capital programme will come forward for next year, which uh, I'm sure will. will Continue, you know, we will have to invest more in it. I don't know if there's anything else. Just oh, sorry, one other thing just before we do is, of course, um, some of the things that the Act talks about are things we are already doing. So, for instance, um, an annual annual visit to your uh, property, we've started 10 to your units um, already, so there are some things where we're heading. Uh, yeah, all I would like to add is that the government are giving the Ombudsman uh, more teeth. They will come down on us heavier than they've ever done in the past. But along with that, the government are giving us no money to deal with those problems. So we have to deal with those problems in probably a uh, more efficient way than maybe we're dealing with them now. 
We haven't got the full details, we won't get them till sometime in the new year, but when we do, it's going to be a big challenge. Um, Councillor Carlson, a question then, Councillor Roberts. Yeah, my question. My question is, um, over the past few weeks in the news, there's been plenty of councils issuing Section 114 notices, which effectively means they're going bankrupt. What's your assessment of our risk of that? Uh, I, I don't think we're at risk at all. I don't know if the Director of Finance or Portfolio Holder wants to comment on that. I, I would say um, we are in a comparatively enviable position compared to other councils. And I would say assess that risk as being minimal, but I'll defer to the Director of Service on that one. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I just echo the comments that um, James just made really. Um, yeah, we continually keep issues under review. Um, I think questions have already been asked tonight about the situation regarding uh, our financial position, our reserves. Um, mitigation features as a significant part of our reserves and that also features as part of our risk management process. And you know, the, the MTFP for the first time ever includes uh, details on this management uh, and that's a very deliberate thing um, to, to highlight uh, the danger some authorities have entered um, through lack of proper governance, lack of risk management and um, not putting these things together. So I think we can sleep safe tonight in the knowledge that we are not at risk of any such thing uh, and actually we're in a very strong financial Councillor Mitch, question? Going on the point of risk check, because it was a question I was going to bring up earlier, obviously you've talked about the key in, 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 um, issues that can impact the plan, I won't go through all of them, but you know, some of them you've mentioned obviously um, are um, you know, it, you know, the medium to, to term economic impacts, um, there's one that particularly drew my attention, um, and you know, what the government's going to do in terms of intervention in, in rent setting uh, policy in future, which I think is a fair point because we recognise that you know rents are high, council rents are lower, but you know people are are, are you know, you know struggling. I didn't see on there, and a budget of it is there. I didn't see um, the uh, risk register for these um, issues, including sort of the likelihood they were going to happen and 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 their impact. Does that exist? And if so, could I? You're nodding great. Could I? Could I be provided with that, please? I, th I think what we um, encapsulated in the report is the strategic risk. Um, not just as obviously there are other risks that we, we manage, and I'm sure we can um, provide a, a, a more detailed answer rather than that. some of those uh, and what they look like and how we manage them accordingly. Um, Council records have been waiting patiently and valiant. Um, I suppose what goes alongside all of this is key performance indicators. And my reason for asking the question, uh, just to ask a question, is. Is the work ongoing in terms of identifying new? We were told there was going to be new key performance indicators. Uh, I've not seen them yet, uh, and so what I don't want to be is in a position come the end of the year, whereby we supposedly have an end of year report, and we're then told, "Oh no, we can't look at this because we're still developing the key performance indicators or whatever." So I'm wondering if you could give them an update and work things out. Um, the new KPIs that we refer to have been in place in September. So, um, if on the council's website, published monthly under the performance page, um, uh, accordingly. But obviously, with uh, the new corporate plan, there'll be you know new ambitions, new streams of work, and performance management and monitoring of all of that will be reviewed accordingly. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just on that, uh, now we've been embedding this peer group review as well. Within our, within our performance monitoring. Um, that, that we, we haven't decided quite yet what, which ones we're going to be measuring ourselves against with the, the peer authorities and the frequency, but I suspect it will be something, there will probably be about a dozen key uh, performance uh, measures for peers and maybe quarterly, half yearly for those. Sorry, Chair. I'll have a conversation with you outside of the meeting and if you could update them, that would be really great. I'd be more than happy to. Thank you. Just, just to add, obviously, we've got the formation of Offlock now, um, the Office for Local Government, Office of Local Government, 
uh, as if that wasn't uh, didn't have enough to do, uh, which will require uh, great um, uh, amounts of data to be uh, returned to it. But just to update members that we are engaged alongside district councils network in actually shaping the work of Otlog, intending to shape the work of Otlog and, and the things that they're looking at to ensure that it is a really meaningful tool and not uh, just, as I think some people fear, a way of getting data out of us to uh, get us over there with. Uh, are there any further questions on the MTFP? Councillor Griggs, have we got a question? No, I do Okay. Uh, there being no further questions, we come to comments. Councillor Lips. Thank you, Chair. Um, I mean, this document does put it pretty starkly in places. Harlow has the lowest average wage and the highest crime of all comparative authorities. Harlow has the highest percentage of unemployment and less than half of Harlow's residents, our residents, feel safe at night. These are damning statistics and show the level of challenge not just for this council or the county council, but the police authority and the government who have really let our town down. I think it is worth emphasising that statistic. 50% of income did come from government, it's now 7.2%. Um, and as a vegetarian, I'll take your salami analogy to eat a tofu if that's all right. Um, but there does come a point where you can't cut any further. And I think, uh, you know, and it's, yes, I know it's, it's a conservative government, so I'm going to make the point, but I do think we need to really make the point that actually, if government are asking us to do more and more, they need to really think about uh, giving some more funding for that. I think we are in a much better position, you're right to say, than other councils. Um, and I know it's not popular to always give credit to the last Labour administration. But actually, I do want to pay tribute to Councillor Mike Danvers, uh, former Councillor Mike Danvers, who worked with, with, with um, Mr Freeman um, and ensured that actually we did have a balanced budget and we didn't have to cut staffing costs despite um, financial challenges. We do know that financial challenges are getting worse and I think we need to take that um, very, very seriously. But I do uh, want to join with you, uh, Chair, and thank um, Mr Freeman and his finance team for, um, you know, year on year, pulling the rabbit out of a hat when it comes to actually, um, you know, dealing with this issue. But I am concerned, as I say, that we are in a position where, you know, we're balancing the books at the moment because we've got staff vacancies. We do need to fill those vacancies, and I just want to raise that concern. Um, and finally, to say what also amused me about the residents survey, uh, which are all uh, just as a lighter point, that only 60, uh, only 26 percent of residents. Um, want to hear from their councillor, so I don't know what that says about us. Any further comments on the MTFP? No? Okay. Councillor Lepard, back to you. Well, well, unless you have anything. No, nothing, I have nothing further to add to it. I just um, recommend it to, to the uh, cabinet. Thank you. Yeah, uh, just, just to clarify a couple of points, it's not the case that our, uh, the money we receive from government is coming from 50% to 7%, it's the, it's the case that the, the central block grant has, but there have been other um, form, forms of finance. Having said that, uh, in, in any field there's only so many rabbits, um, and you get to a point where there's no rabbits left to pull out of the hat, I don't think we're uh, far off that because we've probably sold the hat as well. Um, but having said that, I, I don't think it's all doom and gloom. We are investing huge sums of money into priorities. Uh, we found new ways of doing things. And one of the positives over the last few years and the challenges that faced is that uh, the whole local government sector has innovated uh, and has had to change whether uh, they've enjoyed it or not. And you know, things referenced in the Q2 finance report, which we'll come on to, uh, in terms of income generation, some of the opportunities we have. And, I, I don't think that the, the document understates the fact that Harlow has one of the greatest regeneration programmes in the country, in the words of the OGA this week. Uh, and the income generation that will come from that is uh, something that obviously is not detailed uh, in here. So I, I personally believe, and I'm optimistic, it will be in a much greater financial position over the years uh, to come accordingly. So, uh, thank you again um, to the Director of Finance, uh, particularly the Assistant Director of Finance and the whole finance team as well as the wider leadership team. Uh, and are those recommendations on item 12 agreed? Agreed. Are we good? Uh,
which takes us um, to another finance item, uh, item 13 on pages 74 to 95, which is the financial performance report uh, in quarter two, which I think you're proposing, Councillor. Yes. I'll second that, uh, and over to you. Thank you, Chair. Um, at a time when you know, we've seen so many other large councils at risk or moving into or issuing uh, Section 114 notices, we should take comfort from the fact that our general fund is projected with a favourable variance of 145,000. Um, and that the adverse variance of the HRA has reduced substantially. This is a very strong performance and we're operating well within budget. We're delivering on our priorities and investing even more in areas such as street signage, innovation park. We managed to freeze our council tax. And we've held that for the period of our you know, mandate so far. But we're still managing to operate within budget. So I think many of the doomsters have been frustrated in that regard. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Leppard. Are there questions on Q2 finance? Yeah, we've got a number. If we go to Councillor Gardner first and then we'll work away around. Variety. Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, my question is that um, in quarter one, the projected adverse variance in the HRA was 750,000, which is now down to 543,000, which of course is positive. But with councils across the country struggling, particularly with temporary accommodation, how are we managing to do less? So, take it in the first instance. So, um, specifically on temporary accommodation, there's a number of uh, councils challenged across the country, indeed Harlow's experiencing the challenges. Um, thankfully not in uh, the same way that others are, um, partly thanks to our large housing stock um, and what that allows us to do. Uh, we are currently sitting around the 300 mark uh, in terms of those in temporary accommodation, uh, which is up uh, and unfortunately the, the projection is that homelessness figures are up uh, circa 20% year on year. Um, so there are a number of challenges, specifically on the um, projected adverse variants um, that we're looking at, obviously it is uh, revised down um, and that's uh, through a number of factors which the appendix sets out accordingly. Do you want to add to that? Yes, thank you. Um, yes, thanks for the question. In fact, the variants, um, we had some adjustments from previous years that um, have now been corrected so they won't be repeated. So the figures now we've got, this, this lower base is correct. And, and we expect that to go down even further. Councillor Ritz. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, was, that question was actually part of what I was going to ask. But um, page uh, 89 um, talks about vacancy. Um, sorry, a lot of this is about vacancies. You won't be surprised to know. Uh, vacancies in Revs and Ben's team. Uh, you, kindly wrote to me, uh, uh, Chair, um, about the impact of some of these um, vacancies and you said the impact of additional workloads coupled with vacancies has resulted in a backlog of uh, work across the range of services provided but these are being worked through as quickly as possible. Um, have we got an update on this issue in the Revs and Beds team as looking at the table there is still significant staff vacancies? Yeah, I know that um, specifically in Revs and Beds they've work, been working extremely hard some of the uh, backlog of, of cases that are referred to um, in that, and I commend them for that. I don't know if the director wants to um, give a brief update on that. Thanks, Chair. Okay. Um, so we've been doing some work with um, external interim uh, support to bring resources in to help with the situation, and we are just about to go through a recruitment campaign to seek to secure some more permanent staff. Just, just to add to that, I know that there have been uh, uh, there has been recruitment into the team as well, um, which has improved the position. Yep. Um, thank you. So uh, on page ninety-one, it says uh, the HRA account variance of minus uh, two hundred twenty-five thousand, uh, which is up from one hundred twenty-three thousand in quarter one. Um, which is again is employee costs. Um, in your report to me, Chair, again I do grateful for it. HMO uh, backlog of alleged, uh, alleged HMOs awaiting a, a visit. 
Um, so when last checked, this was in the region of 132 inquiries. So I'm assuming it's 132 that were waiting to be visited at, this, at that time. Uh, it says, licensable uh, HMO inspection program is behind schedule and responses to complaints and inquiries not achieving the 10 day response time. Now, as a, as a war council, first and foremost, as I know we all are, um, you know, and, and somebody used to work at Streets Home, so I recognise that there is a need for HMOs and unfortunately the current um, housing crisis. But I know that, you know, if these aren't properly um, uh, inspected, um, they can be a huge issue for residents. And, you know, I'm sure we've all had uh, that, those dealings. Could you uh, equally give me an update and some reassurance that actually we're tackling um, the, uh, the, the lack of staff um, in, the, uh, in, in this particular department? Yes, the first thing to say is that um, uh, enforcement and licensing of HMO is not an HRS general fund item comes under environmental health um, rather than the housing team. Um, but to, to the point you make, um, there is I know there is progress being made, it's, I know there's been significant challenges in recruitment um, in that area as is being experienced by the whole country uh, in all sectors. Um, the thing, uh, to, the, to the wider point you make about the vacancies, um, of course um, vacancies have an impact um, on capacity uh, but not simply just on capacity, often on resilience of the capacity to, you know, people can do more but not forever. But I would draw your attention to some of the, the, the figures being referred to here. So in terms of, I'll go back to the one you referenced about um, favourable variants of 225,000 employee costs in HRA. Um, that, that is not a vast number of staff, that cost. That's actually a very small number of staff that, that make up that cost um, of a housing service of several teams. Uh, and I, I do think there is um, a, a danger sometimes, and I'm not getting away from the central point to make about the impact, but there is a danger sometimes of uh, slightly underestimating, uh, or overestimating rather, how, how many staff those, those figures make up. Uh, because often the, the resource can be met in different ways, I've just heard in terms of revs and bends. Uh, maybe not ideal, but interim um, support is, is brought in um, accordingly. Specifically on the, the HMO backlog, I don't know um, whether you want to add anything to that other than we're progressing. I can chair. Uh, we've been through a recruitment process to bring us again, a bit like the Revs and Benz team really, to bring in some additional uh, temporary resource and we are hopeful that we've secured some additional resource to specifically focus on that issue between now and March. I should give some more detail in terms of what you mean by temporary resource. Yeah, certainly I can. Um, it'd be an agency uh, appointment through um, an interim uh, worker, a consultant. Uh, from an agency that will work for us for the next three to four months. And to, presumably though, if we go for an agency, that's therefore going to lead to an additional cost um, implication of using an agency, will it not? Yeah, generally speaking, the rates we pay to agency are higher than those that we would pay to a permanent member of staff, but under the circumstances and the situation that the team is in, we will manage that pressure across the uh, rest of the service area to ensure that we remain within our overall budget. Uh, just come to Councillor Carter, I'll catch you more. Uh, yeah, my question is, um, there's a considerable sum of money for projects that are no longer proceeding in the non-housing capital programme. Could you tell me what's going to happen with that money? Is it being allocated somewhere else? Thank you, Chair. Yes, I mean, um, thank you for raising that. But it is set out in the report. Um, if you look at page, uh, I think it's 82, you'll see where the funds have been reallocated. It's also referenced there that there uh, is some of that money um, that's been unallocated. But what I would say is um, reallocation of that money has allowed us to deliver our priorities. And even this evening, uh, you'll be asked in this report to approve more investment into our priorities as a result of um, some of the changes. So an obvious one, for instance, is the fact that we're no longer proposing to spend £600,000 on Osler House. Uh, and instead that money can be reallocated into other priorities uh, accordingly. Or bring down the overall uh, pressure 
in terms of the uh, required finance for the housing capital program. Um, Councillor Vince, no, I think Councillor Sag has had a question. Well, I'll come to you first. Then. These are just very small, small sort of nuanced points, probably, but I just want to raise them. On um, page, I'm not sure about it actually, I think it's page 93, I may be wrong, but um, the play, I think it's not 91, I apologise, but the play our sound system. Um, it says that that's uh, going to cost 270k. In the quarter one report, it was 192k. I wondered what the discrepancy was on that. And I will just one last. I'll do the two because they're really short, quick ones. The other thing was on page 93, you've um, project deferred on lift refurbishment. That always worries me because I think when I hear of lift, I think about accessibility issues. So can you reassure me that that isn't going to cause an accessibility issue? Yeah, so just to clarify, that's not the overall cost of the project, that's the variance. Um, is, is no, no, in terms of the, the sound system, um, one you referred to, the table was talking about variances um, to the project accordingly. And on the lift, um, I, don't, I don't know exactly where you're referring to, is it the playhouse you're talking about? Or I think it is. Yeah, so that's actually based on stock condition data as opposed to a desperate need to refurbish the lift now. Of course, there's a, a, a need to refurbish it, but by not refurbishing it this year, it doesn't have an impact on the sound system. On the first point about the sound system, I get what you're saying, but there are obviously still a discrepancy. Can you explain to me why? Yeah, sorry, can you just clarify where you're referring to? On what page it was on. But there's, there's, it says play our sound system is 260. I'll find it. Do you want to take, <laughs> to take Councillor Sager's question, I'll come back, I'll come back to me. Oh, yeah, so, sorry, I, yeah, I know where you are now. Yeah, so the project has been brought forward from, uh, was projected to be in 24, 25. And, um, and has been brought forward to this financial year as opposed. So in terms of the um, projection for the, for the end of the financial year, uh, that's 270,000 pounds we haven't allocated for being brought forward um, from, from the next financial year when it was originally proposed. Just, the reason I'm confused just because on the previous quarter one it did mention the Playhouse sound system but it was a lower number, do you see what I mean? So what are you just suggesting of doing more this year? Like was the project going to start this year and finish next year and you're doing it all this year? Do you see what I'm, I'm saying? If, if, because if it's, a, I don't, I'm not trying to be fine, I'm just trying to clarify that. Because if it was a case of you, you, you were just bringing it forward then why was there a cost initially, if you see what I'm saying, for this year? Oh, be the, in Q1 it wasn't so, when the budget was set, it wasn't profiled for this year at all. In Q1, it was identified that it was going to be brought forward. There's obviously a difference between what was identified in Q1 and now. Um, I don't know if there's a specific answer on that now. No, we'll, we'll write to you. I'll write to you with, um, to clarify the difference. Okay. You've, prob <laughs> you've probably answered this question, but what was very useful in Q... Well, you, I know what you're going to say, but I, I, I'll ask it anyway. <laughs> In Q1, it was very useful. We've got a table uh, of summary of earmarked reserves, which is really useful. And we don't have it in this resort pack. Is this because you're looking at the reserves? And, and will this be provided for the next quarter? Is it there, sorry? No, it's, it's, it's not. No, it's not, it's not the no. Um, I don't know why that's the case, um, but it is being reviewed, as I said. This thing here was reviewed, I think. Oh, that, that I would imagine is because there were variances in the reserve levels we were approving. Changes um, at that point, so there haven't been. There's not changes at the moment, which is why it's not being reported. Just, well, just on that point, um, as we said, it's going through reviews at the moment. However, when we go to the um, February with the final MTF uh, P, it will be included. Okay, and in the budget. Um, Councillor Sackers. Yeah. Um, so this is the second quarter uh, with. with we brought back a positive uh, variant. Um, considering the financial pressures we're under, uh, how's that possible? <laughs> well, uh, I, I would say personally, maybe not everyone will have the same assessment, but it's, that it's thanks to strong financial management of the council, uh, and that we we remain. Uh, <laughs> um, well, I think others would say that the council's made some fantastic decisions over the past 18 months in things like the acquisition of the Harvey Centre uh, and in terms of other income revenue generation, uh, other efficiency measures, uh, but I appreciate perhaps that's not a view shared by all. Well, about uh, five acres 
that's nothing to do with what we're talking about. Um, so, why, why is the so I, as I said, on the general fund, uh, I think we've had extremely strong financial management. Uh, as, the, uh, as the appendices set out and the report set out, uh, and I can only commend um, the portfolio holder and the finance team and all budget holders in the council for, for doing so. Um, Councillor Griggs, did you have a question? Okay, Councillor Sibbles. The report highlights better than expected performance of the Harvey Centre. Um, when we bought the Harvey Centre, some members said it would bankrupt us and we didn't know what we were doing. Do you think they've improved in well, I'm, I'm not entirely sure they were referring to your group. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> 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 but uh, <laughs> but I, I would say they've been nothing but proven wrong. I mean, the, the finances, uh, the financial performance of the Harvard Centre between uh, when we bought it and I think what was Q3 last year uh, at the end of the financial year was significantly outstripped what we expected. Uh, and in Q1 and Q2, it's outstripped it again. And that's with uh, investment into the Harvey Centre. Um, and again, that has been by through, uh, and I seriously commend both the team on the ground, Brian and the team at the Harvey Centre, but also the asset management team at Montego Evans, who've done a fantastic job, uh, and council and officers at the council. Yes, thank you. I would add to that. Um, yes, there, there was a certain degree of scepticism at the time probably born more out of ignorance than anything else, uh, given that several authorities have gone on wild investment sprees way beyond their, their remits and mandates. The Harvey Centre, though, is, was, a, was, was um, acquired for a strategic purpose and a commercial purpose, but it gave us a huge stake in the town centre, which is essential for the regeneration, and we should not forget that was the reason behind it. Secondly, we undertook meticulous due diligence through um, Montague Evans, who are exceedingly professional in this. The scenario analysis that was taken in was extremely pessimistic. In fact, uh, you could almost say it was a doomsday scenario. Um, it included that the entire uh, top floor would be vacant, which of course it wasn't. So the uh, investment has proven to be very sound and the outlook is very optimistic. Thank you. In the interest of my own group unit, it may be a good idea to move on from that topic. Um, are there any further any further questions on Q2 finance? Yeah. Did you have one, Council, please? No? No further questions, uh, comments on Q2 finance, Council Lintz? On the discussion of uh, private unity, I'd like to say that uh, my group is fully in favour of the private the Harvest Centre. I seem to remember I even seconded the proposal when it came to the council, and I think it was the right decision. And and, and, and the point about the Harvest Centre that, 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 that hasn't been made, I know this, this rare agreement is weird, isn't it? But um, I think that, you know, actually the other thing to say is that one of the criticisms of the, that we, we raised when we were in administration was actually the lack of um, the amount of the town centre that we owned as a council. And I think it was an opportunity to take I won't use that phrase, <laughs> but but actually to do that. Um, and to answer Councillor Sayers' uh, question, honestly, part of the issue with Councillor Sayers is the fact that there are no staff. There's massive staff vacancies, um, and that does lead to uh, an issue in services. And I thank the work that uh, Mr Freeman is doing to try and deal with these issues. But again, it's a little bit like sticking past politics. We need actually um, to be uh, able to recruit some full-time positions. Uh, and I appreciate that that isn't just because you so I appreciate there is a challenge being close to London to attract the right people, but I think you know it is important that we do that. And you know, as a as a as a as a um, opposition, we also want to support getting the right officers in. But that does, of course, have financial implications. Any further comments? No, thanks, Councillor. Yes, I, I would like to um, <coughs> acknowledge um, Councillor Vince's comment, recognising that the um, Labour. Uh, group did support the acquisition of the Harvey Centre. And my comment about um, observations made out of ignorance was in no way referring to them. It was talking about third parties outside who, yeah, no, who generally criticised it um, without any of the facts at hand. So that's my comment. Thank you. Very good. Uh, well, I, I 
I won't uh, give my um, analysis of why we're in a strong financial position. The thing I would just clarify is um, I absolutely appreciate the challenges of capacity and resilience and resource that we have, uh, without doubt. And you know, again, I do honestly believe, and I know in fact we're in a much better position than a number of other local authorities, but it's not the case to say we've got no staff. We've got an FT of circa 450 staff. Uh, we also employ over 350 staff at HDS, uh, which gives us amongst our peer group the highest uh, FT of any council. So I wouldn't say it's fair to say that we have uh, no staff. We have an extremely strong, uh, talented, committed uh, officer corps which are delivering um, fantastic financial management. So on that bright note, uh, Q2 finance report uh, recommendations, are they agreed? Agreed. Apologies, which takes us on to item 14, which is uh, pages 96 to 104, uh, which is the North Essex Council's uh, item, uh, which I'll propose. Is there a second there for that? Council Leopard. Uh, so, yes, a uh, brief introduction um, to this. Uh, the North, uh, North Essex um, Council's grouping uh, has been recently formalised. Uh, South Essex Council's has uh, as the map uh, highlights has been uh, a long established um, partnership with the North Essex Council's uh, partnership is a more recent one. Um, there's been a number of joint leader and chief executive meetings uh, in recent months uh, and more regular um, chief executive only meetings uh, to progress some of these issues. Uh, and it's a genuine group of uh, all political colours uh, facing very similar challenges and uh, working together to address some of those challenges and at the most recent meeting uh, we had a few weeks ago uh, we identified some of the priorities for uh, North Essex Council's grouping about opportunities for shared services, um, shared opportunities to tackle some of the temporary accommodation challenges we were having and budget pressures uh, as well as um, work on climate change and economic mm -hmm. growth across the area. So uh, we are in the early formation uh, of really moving this forward uh, which is why it's being brought to Cabinet at this point um, and seeking um, some of the delegations it is to act accordingly. Uh, but I think it's an extremely bright prospect. Uh, and like I say, there are um, uh, leaders from different political colours, although I think I've just realised there's not actually a Labour leader in the group, but um, there are leaders from different political colours who you know, are all facing similar challenges. It's a very uh, positive working environment to, to move those forward. Um, so, on that note, are there any questions on North Essex Council? Councillor Lurkin. Sorry, I've got four questions, if I may. In relation to uh, the options, it was either we accept this or do nothing. And I was just wondering whether or not, because of the economic, environment, health, social and social sector, why have we not also looked at uh, buddying up or being in a partnership with the West Essex and Hertfordshire corridor, similar to the ICB? over those particular issues. Um, the second question is in relation to the implications. It's indicating that we as a council will have to pay £20,000 a year to belong to this uh, group. And I just need a clarification. How was that £20,000 has arrived at? Was that per head of population? Or was it the size of the council or the number of people um, in, in that particular area? Uh, my third one is in the implications around governance is there doesn't seem to be any democracy in this at all. There's no openness, there's no scrutiny, we don't know who's going to be on the panel, how is that going to fairly represent the, the, the wider uh, community. And, and my uh, final question, if I may, is this uh, seems um, a long time in, in, in coming, which is the destruction of Essex County Council. Um, and I hope that's the case, and I hope it's not just another secret bureaucratic talk shop, but it does sound like it, we're preparing this as some sort of prelude to the Greater Essex Combined Authority. And again, um, is that just going to be another quango? Thank you. Very good. Right, I'll take your uh, questions in turn. The first thing to say is this is, um, this is the uh, formation and formalising of a partnership. It's not an exclusive thing. It's not the case that because we're in this, we can't deal with other councils. It's just recognising that in the geographic area that we are working in, you know, 
we're far closer to East Hearts than we are to Tenbury. Um, but this is, this is a, a grouping that's in place. Um, initially driven by the devolution work that was going on, South Essex had a particularly strong voice in those negotiations. North Essex um, didn't and certainly didn't have a joined up voice and that's where this uh, initially drove from. So it's not the case that it's just, you know, because we're North Essex can't work in the sort of corridor um, that you reference and we will continue to do so. Um, in terms of the financial contribution of £20,000, uh, that's the same contribution for all um, partners in it and I think the report sets out um, what that's financing, but it's essentially financing resource to take forward the priorities we agreed. So shared services being one of them, in order to bring about shared services there needs to be a significant amount of investment of resource into creating those opportunities and allowing us to re realise them accordingly, so we will do so. Um, in terms of the governance um, implication that you mentioned, any decision we're not we're not um, you know no decision making powers moving away from the council. So any decision making uh, about anything that affects the council is still made here by the cabinet or full council or other means accordingly. Um, it's not um, it's not you know we're not sort of giving up powers to to another quang as you put it. Um, it's simply a, a partnership um, to, to help or aim to address some of the shared challenges we're facing. And on the fourth thing about uh, Essex County Council and uh, what that may mean uh, for Essex County Council, um, the, as you'll be aware, there's uh, ongoing work to finalise the Tier 2 devolution deal that has been negotiated. Uh, and actually what this partnership will allow is proper representation uh, from North Essex and South Essex, where that wasn't previously um, proposed to be the case on the command authority that is that is proposed. So I can't, um, well, I certainly don't have the power um, to grant your wish to uh, get rid of Essex County Council, um, and this this group won't do that either. I'm afraid. Um, further questions? Sorry. Yeah, the financial contribution bit. Oh, okay. Um, Councillor Seals. Um, the recommendation is to give the leader and the chief executive delegated authority to act accordingly in this. Um, how far does that delegation go? We've been caught now. Um, no, I'm joking. It comes to the point actually Councillor Durkin made. Uh, it's, a, it's, essentially, it's essentially to be able to act accordingly in the partnership. Um, that is largely within uh, the, the delegations that we already both hold. Um, we're not proposing to do anything otherwise, like I said, the decision making that requires any uh, input from cabinet or council will still be taken here. Um, accordingly, it's just allowing us to act on behalf of the council in that sphere. Okay. Councillor Leppard. Thank you, Chair. When you look at the map, uh, we are by far the smallest there. How are the other councils like viewing our participation in this? Uh, well, it, back to the point Councillor Durkin made, it's um, about sort of governance. There's no, each partner is e equal, um, equally weighted. You know, there's one leader and one chief executive there. It's not uh, sort of done in any other way. The other thing I'd say is that our population is higher than a number of the. Um, yeah. A number of the um, authorities and the partnerships just don't agree geographical area. The, the wider point I'd make, uh, and this genuinely is not a political one, is that I think that the partners are extremely pleased with our those engagement uh, in this because I think that's something we haven't done well enough previously, although it's early days. Um, further questions? Uh, sorry, Councillor Cartap, I'll now come to you. I think you partly answered my question. It was just that um, what have we not already done and been part of this in the past? Why has Harlow not engaged in this type of thing previously? Uh, well, the, the North Essex Council specifically is, uh, like I said, a relatively new partnership. Um, however, um, I, I will tell the anecdote that um, when I turned up to the first North Essex partnership, meeting, um, I was greeted by uh, a slightly older, uh, 60 years, years or so, 
council leader uh, who laughed and said, this is the first leader we've had from Harlow for years um, to any of these sort of things. Um, that's purely anecdotal. Um, but I think our, well, it's not because I was there and that's what happened. Um, and uh, that is, I think, a welcome sign of our engagement in some of the wider Essex things are called. Are there any further questions? No, come to comments. Councillor Laird. Sorry, I just have to take you up on that one. I think, yeah, again, we've seen another example of how the Tories want to rewrite history. If you actually look at the parking partnership, which was a classic uh, well, on about that one. Harlow was very actively involved in that, and I know because I was a member of that for a number of years. And certainly uh, one of the previous leaders, John Klempner, was also involved with chief executives and leaders of the North Essex, looking at where we could work together, certainly around at the time around what was happening about the growth of Stansted, Ottlesford and Jobs. So I just to remind you, that the person who gave you that anecdote was clearly wrong. And I'm glad I can correct it. Any further comments? Hi. Yeah, can't I can just echo uh, I'd just echo the point that was made by Councillor Durkin earlier, which is in relation to the links with Hertfordshire. Um, certainly in um, and whilst whilst I can I can see the argument can see a strong argument for this uh, more passive partnership and what have you. Mm. On the other hand, in terms of where, in terms of what specifically impacts on us, it's the stalked corridor in particular mm. and the east and um, um, going west and the links, particularly with the Harlow Gilson Garden Town. And eventually there will be a link, a transport link going all the way across to and Auckland, which is half the um, so I would, I would just echo if, we, if, we, if it's possible, possible for if any similar initiatives come up in terms of looking at cross cross county county work, um, I, would, I would hope that we could be involved in that. You're increasing your standing orders. Because it is obvious the meeting is going over half past nine. Mr. Howard, I'm afraid that standing that standing order doesn't apply to cabinet. That standing order doesn't apply to cabinet meetings. And I will tell you now. If you interrupt the meeting, I asked for education at that point. Yeah, it doesn't. I came for a deal, and he he said I was right. Doesn't apply to cabinet meetings. Uh, that standing order doesn't apply to cabinet well, meetings. I, well, I'll Mr. Howard, my apologies. My apologies for. The wrong information. I'm only acting on information okay. received from the council. Right, it's, it's the last time I'll tell you that you're not here to participate. You're more than welcome to stand you to be a councillor. You can really throw me out any time you like. You, you're more than welcome to stand to be a councillor and contribute to the meetings accordingly. But at the moment, you're not. Uh, so, on that note, are there any further comments? <coughs> no. Uh, in which case, uh, just in response to. Um, Councillor Edwards' point, absolutely. I mean, we're already part of the UK Innovation Corridor, which is uh, a, a sort of an extension of the area that you reference and will continue to work accordingly. I think this is a really positive step forward um, in terms of uh, seeking to address some of the challenges that all councils are facing, particularly in this area, uh, and is an exciting prospect. So, on that note, are recommendations A to D agreed by the Cabinet? Uh, which takes us to item 15, which is Major Housing Works Business Process Review, page 105 to 122 uh, of the pack, uh, which I think Councillor Carter is proposing. Yes, I propose this. Uh, I'll second that. Uh, so over to you, Councillor Carter. Um, right, as far as uh, the roofing and major works programme is concerned, obviously we've worked on this now for nearly a year and the last six months we've altered it and altered it and altered it and today we brought this to cabinet and we believe that this is a fair representation going forward of our plan to deal with the major repairs in the town. Any questions? Yeah so just to add to that uh, obviously the review was following um, the evident um, shortcomings in the process following the five acres case uh, and as such a 
thorough review has been conducted and this is something to, to very genuinely thank uh, the whole housing operations and um, property service and uh, home ownership and all sorts of teams in housing on because it's been a huge piece of work. Uh, I think evident throughout the report is the serious benchmark that's been done against other authorities in terms of generosity of uh, payment options. I think a lot has been done to both improve the consultation process but also to set that out very clearly um, and add points to the consultation process which weren't there previously. And I think one of the evident uh, challenges with the Five Acres case was that uh, leaseholders felt works were being proposed that there wasn't the evidence to demand at that point. And I think the revised process certainly addresses that. It's a, we believe to be a very fair but robust new process which will significantly improve leasehold consultation, section 20 consultation, uh, but at the same time allow us to get on with the programme of refurbishing uh, and improving some of the over 700 flat blocks we have in the town uh, to do so. So, are there any questions? Councillor Seals? Um, following the five acre scheme shambles, will the changes oh, made stop the flats? Will the changes made stop that from ever happening again? At this present moment, I think it will. Yeah, I think there, there's been significant work done. The report sets out um, the changes that have been made to the process. I think we've already seen, and one of the appendices, for instance, is a newsletter with more Grove residents, and I think that sets out significant improvement uh, in, in what we're doing. So, I, again, I can only commend um, the housing team for the work on that. Um, Councillor Edwards, I think you had a question. Thank you. I feel like my line I'll get a newsletter and I don't actually even want to go over, but I spend a lot of my time there. Um, uh, just um, on um, uh, the 106 early consultation with residents, uh, let to residents uh, once work has been agreed as part of the annual housing capital programme. And again, I appreciate these are the changes, so they might be in the more substantive document. But I think my feedback certainly from talking to residents at Wed Hay where obviously we know major works are going on and obviously you know you've used more degrade which also in my ward as an example. Um, I wonder what we do before that, if we do anything before that, um, you know, because this is then once the works have been agreed, in terms of and I'm sure you're nodding so so great, but if you could just outline really what we do to make residents aware that we are because I think the issue I think we'd all recognise is that residents get a nasty shock when they, they get that first letter with a potentially estimated bill. And I think, as sort of, as my train of thought's thinking, the other thing on that is, you know, I get residents constantly going, oh God, I've got to pay this amount of money because it's an estimated bill. So I think it's about how we reassure them of, of the process throughout. Just before Councillor Carr comes to it, I draw your attention to Appendix A, uh, which sets out a flow diagram of the new process, which I think there is. Well, there's several steps before the letter you mentioned. The first being an introductory letter, um, and all of that, and then there's a number of steps after it. Um, we've also, I know uh, Councillor McCarthy may comment on it, but uh, looked at the wording of some of the letters um, and you know how things are explained to people. There's a number of other things coming on stream, um, uh, updates to our website to explain that process more clearly. There's creation of a video to explain Section 20 consultation and how that works. Um, even though yeah, just from the point of view, um, if you look on page 113, the flowchart goes from the introductory letter right to the final newsletter, and there's a lot of process through that. Um, there's also a lot of process uh, which we've done the benchmarking of how people pay for this. And I think when we had uh, not, not so much um, uh, the, the one that caused the problem, we had another meeting afterwards with the residents of Wedhay. And that really and truthfully wasn't the way that we should run a meeting. So in future, if people accept what's happening, fine. If they don't accept that, we will have them in the council on an individual basis to talk them through the process individually to reassure them. 
So yeah, it's come back on that. Obviously, I was in that meeting as well as the War Council, and I totally recognised that some of the ways that the officers were treating that meeting wasn't, wasn't appropriate. I, I, just, I, I agree with you entirely on, on, on that. I think, though, and I, I recognise why you're saying doing individual is absolutely fine, but I think there probably needs to be a mechanism by which actually residents can sort of, I mean, I suppose you could either they go out and knock on their neighbours' doors, perhaps, but a mechanism by which actually residents can uh, collectively sort of discuss the issue and actually perhaps clearer guidelines on what they can do if they aren't happy. Um, I know there are, I, I know, uh, uh, probably, I know that in, in the past the council sort of actually um, volunteered bringing in a third party um, to, 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 to kind of make sure everything's been done properly and maybe that's part of this process but yeah I don't know quite my question is there but I think you kind of get the, the drift of kind of how we're going to make sure that residents are able to still you know have that collective voice as well as just being spoken to individually I think it's probably the question. So there's, there's a number of ways already so um, there is of course uh, existing methods like leaseholders um, panel etc where such things uh, can take place. I do also think that the, the added steps to the process will allow that. I mean, ultimately, it's not entirely the council's job to, you know, bring the residents together to discuss um, this as they see fit, because obviously it's still on an individual basis. But we know that. Yeah, just from the point of view of, you know, when you've got um, a block of flats with, say, 50 or different people in there, you might get 20 of them at the council tenants and they haven't got a problem with this. Obviously, everything to them is going to be an improvement. Then you've got people who are residents and leaseholders, and they sometimes have a problem with this. The major problem is the landlord leaseholders. They don't want to pay any money for any of this. So we have to make sure that we go through the proper process explaining to them most of this work, obviously, is after the Grenfell situation where we have new fire regulations which we have to adhere to and all councils across the country uh, you know, have got this uh, situation. What we want to do is make sure that we do the work properly, engage with each of the leaseholders uh, and, and tenants if they've got um, a problem, uh, engage with them right through the process um, and as you can see on the in the back, there is a, um, uh, a letter. Um, uh, the newsletter that went that was is going out to those in Barley Grove, and that will be a similar first letter, first newsletter to all residents in the seven hundred lot that we've got to contend with over the next few years. I think the, the other very valid point, and I'm, I'm sure it was an anecdotal assertion about leaseholders not wanting to pay, I'm sure there are some, but not all perhaps, um, is that, you know, it, it is the case that we're, you know, there is a request from the freeholder of the property to pay large sums of money in, um, in many cases. You could argue significant upgrades to the property loan, the value of the property loan is going to rise dramatically, but you know, there are very genuine people who uh, have big challenges to face with some of these bills, which is why uh, there's also been a lot done in here about um, payment <coughs> options. Um, and in paragraph 18, it's got a table of payment options, just to highlight cabinet's um, options to that. I mean, in terms of benchmark against, and these were authorities that were done for good reason, um, in terms of prompt payment discount, um, we're one of three out of five that offers that. In terms of um, interest-free monthly instalment periods, uh, again, we're one of, um, not the most, but one of the most generous. In terms of interest-free loan period, we are by far the most generous. I mean, we're, we're offering up to 10 years as opposed to the next comparable as Redbridge um, at three years. Um, you know, and then Epping, Stevenage and Wolfham Forest don't offer at all. Um, so we have done an awful lot of work on uh, how that's done, and of course, uh, and the other thing the report references is that we are watching a review into the possibility and feasibility of sinking funds, and some of the residents often raise uh, about that point. At the same point, they did exist previously, and leaseholders that decided that they didn't want to do that anymore. Uh, but never, nevertheless, it is um, something that we're going to be looked at. And, there is a further review of the current lease agreement planned for next year um, as part of the, the project and 
you know, we've said in offices we'll look at some of the options as to whether we could introduce, for instance, a monthly service charge through which nature works um, accordingly, whether that's a feasible thing um, to, do, to do or not. And of course, the other thing that the report, I'm, I'm sure, will reference somewhere is that at any point that a uh, leaseholder uh, may disagree or challenge what we're doing, they do have the option to refer the matter to the first tier tribunal and to have that looked at independently. I think we might say we've done it ourselves on the wet hay. The wet hay case. Yeah. Are there further questions? Councillor Garnet, and then we'll go around to it. A little bit before this here, on page 117, um, second paragraph, completion of major works. It says, when the works is completed, your property will be returned to its original condition. <laughs> Uh, perhaps we need a comment rather than a full stop, which refers to the uh, building materials. Uh, yeah, fair, fair. Um, Purse. Um, sorry, I was just giggling from that comment. Um, I just wanted to ask, how many uh, leaseholders does this affect across the town? And uh, another question, the second one. Um, uh, how much of this is actually legal? Could I just have some clarification? Yes. So in terms of leaseholders, I think often like there's well over 2,000 um, across you know the over 700 flat blocks we have, um, and you know there'll be a number of different lease agreements within that. Um, in terms of the the legality, I think mean, it's all legal. Um, I think the point is obviously um, you know how much is what the law sets out, how much we have the ability to change, and um, section 20 of the legislation is pretty clear on. Uh, what influence we can have, where we do have discretion on things like payment options, we we'll obviously exercise them. Uh, but on many factors, there, there isn't discretion. I mean, the simple premise is if you, you acquire a leasehold in the property and the freeholder you know, is going to upgrade the property, you have to foot your part of the bill. That's you know, what it sets out. So, um, you know, there are elements of discretion where we've exercised it, and there are many where there, is, you know, there isn't discretion. Yeah, I was just going to add that we do have leaseholder panels on a regular basis. We have some extremely good people come to those panels. Sometimes you get people come to the panels who've got a problem with their lease up, their flat block, uh, and when it's solved, they never come back again. But we have some really nice people on the panels who ask lots of questions, and they're on the panel year after year. And obviously, any leaseholder that wants to join the panel is more than welcome. Councillor Edwards, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this question, I'm not saying I'm totally understanding this graph. This, uh, Just need to put the microphone. I'm not saying I'm totally understanding the table. Um, and you're, you've got figures going up to 13,000 and what have you. When we know that um, um, leaseholders have been asked for figures of um, what, what asked to find. 30,000, 40,000. I just wonder whether or not that, that table sufficiently reflects the sort of uh, you know, from why, why it's and it goes up to 13,000. So there's a question there. Um, you just turn my phone. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, it's a, it's a fair point. I think it's um, mainly driven by the months of repayment. Um, but obviously, it's uh, uh, sets out quite clearly what the the sort of changes depending on the month's repayment and invoice value. So um, you know it's quite easy to work out how it goes up. Obviously, it could have been done differently. My point, therefore, will therefore be that if you're not careful, you will get you. We will have leaseholders say, "Well, this looks perfectly reasonable," unless you know, unless one's looking for a figure of. Forty thousand pounds is was done. You know, we, we know that those sort of figures are quite. So I'm just wondering whether or not we, we, we could you could look again at that that table and and, uh, and, uh, and, and tilt it towards what what are likely to be realistic figures, as it were. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we're, uh, the officer's going to um, 
have another look at the, the table, Gordon Lynn, and see how that goes. But obviously it's also, um, as it mentions elsewhere, there's different payment options, Gordon Lynn, so obviously it's, yeah, it changes, but we're going to have another look at that. Um, were there further questions on this? No? Uh, comments? Councillor Edwards? Can I say, um, in terms of the work that has been done, in terms of the interest-free loan, I remember when we were talking about the uh, five acres one, one and, this is, uh, and I remember raising the issue at that time, because at that point it was a, a five-year option, if I remember rightly, for interest-free loan, and then some of the council cards took it up, etc. and you know, the other council cards uh, took it up. Um, so, so I, I, I uh, welcome this. I also welcome the uh, the clarity that's been been laid out much more in terms of process, etc. I mean, I suspect it will be an iterative process in the sense of because as we go through each of these, and we've got a number of flat blocks and what we across the test, uh, there will be lessons learned from each each time we do this, and. Uh, so I wouldn't see this process necessarily being fixed in stone, as it were. I think it's something we'll need to come back and, and uh, um, yeah, change as and when, as it were. But, uh, but it's a good start. Further comments? Thanks for it. Yeah. Uh, just again, I mean, I've been involved, you know, with, with the issues in my ward with regards to this. I think. Perhaps it's good that we've looked at it and reviewed it. I suppose my concern moving forward is just that early um, identification, that early kind of making uh, the, the, the residents aware of that this is coming. Um, and I think, I suppose, you always want a big sort of neon pink envelope that says, this is really important, you must open it or something. Do you know what I mean? Because the, I think the danger is, you know, people do miss letters and then they suddenly get a big shock and then they come to you going, oh, I didn't know about this. Now, I appreciate there's only so much the council could do, but I've just emphasised the importance of doing it and making sure that you, you know, you've elaborated some of the things that we're going to do as well as just send them a letter. But I think it's just so important that they are aware that this issue is, is coming up and, and they're aware with, with, with plenty of time. Councillor um, Sagan. I, um, I welcome this as being the leaseholder um, and the early engagement with the leaseholders. Um, because not only three years ago did uh, this council not engage with leaseholders um, and gave them three weeks notice to sort out their gas and electric certificates during a pandemic when service people weren't available to get the certificates. No comments? No, it's back to Councillor Carter. Yeah, what I'd like to say about this process, I mean, this is the start of the process, obviously, page 113 gives from the introductory letter to the final newsletter. But obviously, we will review this depending on what happens in each, each uh, flat block that we go into. We might find other things that come along, so we'll review this accordingly. But what you have to remember is this is not a little... Um, uh, 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 Deal. It's a big deal. We've got 700 of these, and a lot of them are, uh, they don't cover the fire risks. The fire risks are not there. So, for the council for the next few years, this is a big deal. Yeah, and just to um, come back to some of the comments, uh, I mean, I think one of the points, particularly the Council of Vince made about um, leaseholder awareness, is actually about the, the awareness of what their lease states. I think often it's a big challenge in that um, leaseholders aren't aware of, of what Section 20 is and what uh, that process means. So that's why things like the video are being done to help explain uh, the process and actually make people aware of the point that they require a leasehold that this is, you know, at some point in the future this will be the process because uh, everyone who requires a leasehold that's, you know, providing they hold it for some time, is going to have works done to the property um, and therefore needs to understand the process. So um, I think it's an extremely welcome piece of work that I think everyone would recognise a great deal of effort and uh, expertise has come, gone into it. Um, particularly pay tribute to um, Assistant Director of Housing Property, Wendy, uh, and all her teams, including Dave, 
uh, but all of the teams, home ownership, um, property services, all of them that have worked on this, because this is no small feat, this is an extraordinary piece of work, uh, and one which will genuinely uh, make a massive difference to people, um, and that's what we're here to do. So, uh, with that in mind, um, does the cabinet note uh, the changes that have been made to the report, uh, to the process? Oh, good, too. Jolly good. Uh, which brings us to um, item 16, the freehold or freehold disposal of Osler House, pages 123 to 127, which I think Councillor uh, Leppard is proposing. Yeah. yeah. Is there a second of that? Councillor Carter, uh, Councillor Lepo, over to you. Thank you, Chair. This, this has been a, a long cycle. Um, Oster House uh, was originally run by the West Essex uh, Clinical Commission Group, who withdrew their funding support from the former medical practice, Rossler House in Bostrick, in April 2018. The owners at the time, the Harlow uh, Health Centre Trust, sought uh, another service provider but were unsuccessful and the property remained empty from that time onwards. Harlow Council acquired the freehold in October 2019 for £200,000 with plans to bring it back into use. However, all the community-based schemes, um, well, the timing was unfortunate as we were about to enter into COVID, and all the community-based schemes fell on the, on the grounds of viability, as the property um, required substantial um, repairs and improvements. Obviously, after COVID, the situation was exacerbated further. This administration, working with the local community group, they had plans to set up a Street community hub, set aside £226,000 for refurbishment works as a co-participation with the um, local charity. However, the, the repair works spiralled out of budget and in 2022, when they were looking um, with the uh, local association, the uh, costs had spiralled up to 400, over £400,000. That was an estimate provided by HTS at the time. <clears throat> Our latest figures are currently around 550, possibly even £600,000. The property continued to deteriorate. And finally, um, Mind, uh, the charity Mind, which is currently operating in Bush Fair, expressed interest in acquiring the building as a centre to promote health and well-being. It should be pointed out that there is a restrictive covenant over the site that it can only be used for uh, health purposes, health and well-being. However, mind coming along gave us an opportunity for the council to generate the capital we see from what was fast becoming a liability far more than an asset. And it was also a means of giving back, uh, or bringing this back into circulation as a very useful community asset. We discussed this with the Harlow Residents Association, Harlow Common Residents Association, <coughs> and kept them fully informed. But in parallel, we worked with them on uh, an allotment project as well, which is still ongoing. Going back to the, the mine business, um, it's very clear Harlow um, Council is not undertaking any contribution whatsoever to the repair works. An independent Red Book valuation was undertaken by Derek Wade Waters, and uh, that offer or that, in, that valuation has been accepted by mind. If this is approved, um, there will be a formal independent valuation that will take place uh, and will be commissioned to verify the market value stated by WW. Um, WW. So hopefully this, this will now be a fantastic chance for both Potter Street and Mind uh, and for the Council to rid itself of what has become, you know, um, across the bear. The, the cost of repairs are 
continuing to increase. So as long as we hold this, um, we have a liability. And with no prospect of any party wishing to buy it. Um, I, can, I can assure you the only party that's expressed any interest was mine. Um, w, uh, D, uh, DWW were of the opinion that there would be no ready takers for this. So I recommend that we go ahead with this deal um, and it will be a great benefit to both the council and for the Post Street community. Thank you. Thanks. Just before uh, we go to questions, uh, I want to take the opportunity to um, genuinely and sincerely thank um, the uh, group for the work they've done uh, over many years, um, led by Colin Thorpe, who I'm pleased to see here, um, and uh, Maggie, the great distinction, um, to ensure that there is proper investment into Plot Street. I think this is a good opportunity to, to move some of those things forward. So, over to questions, Katado. Uh, yes, <coughs> thank you very much, and James. I do uh, <coughs> share with you that this has been a really bad uh, story, so hopefully, we're going to try and get to uh, some sort of happy ending. So, I've just got a couple of questions, if I may. Uh, the first one is uh, <coughs> Is the valuation for the building or the land? <coughs> My, um, uh, I was also very pleased. Uh, for you to confirm that not a single penny of the council's money uh, will be going into the investment into that building. But realistically, how is a charity going to afford up to three quarters of a million pounds when you add on the cost of the house, uh, the building, as well as the repairs over these particular issues? Um, I welcome the covenants because I didn't see that in the report. Uh, but I also would hope it would go back further that we could have a buyback scheme uh, because actually the worst thing we could do is then allow it to go on to uh, a private healthcare uh, provider. Um, I wonder what assurances can you give, and I think you have given some, that the community will be fully involved and fully engaged in this, um, certainly for the use of the facilities if it's, if it's possible. Uh, and my final question is, what uh, money is left that can be reinvested back into Potter Street as a result of um, these challenges that we've been facing over a, uh, a couple of years? Uh, so there's a number of questions there, so if you take them, take them the Okay, I mean, I'll, uh, firstly about um, where do mine get their money from? Um, we understand that there are specific grants for this, okay, that's one. But even so, checking their um, accounts on uh, the Charities Commission, they have very strong liquidity and, and strong reserves. But I understand there's a specific grant for this. Um, as to what was the, what was the other one? Oh, <coughs> uh, no, I threw it <laughs> The first one. Are we just selling the building? Okay, that's it. Or are we selling the land? Because I tell you what, there's a little crappy bit of wildlife land at the side, is that what they're going to take over or is that something that still could be used by the community? No, I think they, they are buying the freehold of both the land and the, and, and the property. Yeah, just to remind you, you need to turn your microphone off when you stop speaking. Sorry. Did that answer your questions? Yeah. Yep. Super. You, uh, further questions? <clears throat> Councillor Seals? Um, as Ward Councillor for Potter Street, what assessment has been made um, of this in terms of benefit to Potter Street community? Well, I suppose it, it is still early days because the deal hasn't been uh, concluded yet. Um, if we look at what we've got at the moment, we have a, a derelict building that's deteriorating, providing no benefit to anybody. Um, Mind is a well-established and well-respected charity highly committed to this project and we understand, and I can't go further than this and I won't at this stage, that they would be more, that, well, they would be very willing to engage with the Harlow Residents Association, Harlow Commonwealth Residents Association or such community groups to look at um, how there could be some collaboration in using some of those facilities. That they have. But I can't go further than that because that's not up for us to negotiate. 
the other question, sorry, Karen Sturkin asked that we didn't answer, was about the money saved being reinvested. Um, so there is, in the, in the Q2 finance reports, there were um, uh, references to where money was being diverted to other projects initially. Um, but what I would say specifically on the Pot Street stuff, there is um, a lot of investment proposed, um, and I know it's been uh, somewhat commented on, um, so the former neighbourhood office, which obviously been empty for 20 odd years, uh, the, the, well, it's going to planning committee next week to be converted into five um, social rented apartments. And the bit of scrubland that sits next to that, um, where there used to be a former apartment and so on, um, 38 new car parking spaces for the community centre, obviously the five flats, but also Brentford Towers, um, which will help significantly. And then in terms of other investments into Bot Street, they'll come, come forward accordingly. Uh, Councillor Carlton. Yeah, thank you, Chief. Um, in the recommend, recommended to the Cabinet, number B, it says approve plans to dispose of the Council's freehold interest in Ossel House via private treaty to mine in West Essex. What's a private treaty? A private treaty would be um, an agreement to sell to a, between two parties rather than us putting it out to say to tender. Okay. Um, having said that, we already know that um, we found no other parties expressing any interest whatsoever. And mine is a highly credible purchaser for, the, for those purposes. So, other questions? No? Any comments? Councillor? Um, um, yes, yeah, so, uh, certainly I think anybody uh, should welcome this initiative uh, and it's been a long time coming uh, that we've actually found uh, someone who is willing uh, to take on this opportunity and I think it's really important because we've invested so heavily in Potter Street and it is a car bunker sitting on the corner by the bus stop where everybody can see it all the time and actually not only to restore the building but actually use it for mind which is actually putting mental health on the front page of an iconic building which is actually saying it's okay we can help we can support I think is a really really strong and positive uh, message o over these issues. I also welcome it because the problem that uh, <coughs> might have is that they're, they're upstairs and that therefore if you've got a disability you cannot visit them, they have to visit you. So to actually have it on a ground floor which is going to have instant and available accessibility um, I think is, is, is uh, uh, something that we want. I really, really do hope <coughs> that they will work um, with the community and allow the community access when they can because they are a great community but actually doing nothing was not an option so to do this I think should be welcomed and applauded. Any further comments? <coughs> no, back to you Councillor Well um, on that note and with that sort of encouragement from Councillor Durkin I strongly recommend that we proceed as proposed and I do thank him and uh, agree with his comments. Thank you. Yeah, and, and just one thing uh, to pick up, and I'm glad you sat down, is um, I, I genuinely commend the work that you've personally done and that the former administration done in terms of investment into Potstreet. And I wholly reject this notion uh, that the, the, the council as a body does not care about Potstreet or is not invested in Potstreet. You know, I may have disagreements on how some things came about, but uh, Prentice Place, uh, the development at Merrick Mead, the, the, the Splash Park, the new uh, park there, all, all sorts of investments in Spotstreet which have um, helped to revive that community. It doesn't mean there's not more to do, uh, but I do genuinely reject this notion that um, you know nothing has been done there. It is an amazing community. You know, I think the. Uh, change of use for the, the former neighbourhood office, uh, the new parking there, I think they're all further investments which should be welcome. Uh, and I think it's a very good uh, way forward too. So on that note, uh, does Cabinet approve recommendations A to C? Yeah. Approved, yeah, totally good. Uh, which takes us to item 17, private housing assistance policy DFGs, 
pages 128 to 138. Councillor Kershaw proposing this. Yeah. So a second for that? Yeah. Councillor Carter, over to you, Councillor. So, first of all, I'd like to actually thank the officers that have um, done the work on this, which is uh, Nora Noland and uh, Chris Bennett. Um, in the fact, I'd like to thank them first of all. So, I bring this for, uh, forward for approval. Um, so, first of all, uh, adopting uh, the proposed will give us greater flexibility to help with adaptations which are not currently available through the D DFG um, on the existing policy. Um, this is for the private um, um, home areas. Um, the current housing assistance policy approved in 2019 was uh, capped at uh, £10,000 and for a fast track grant. Uh, since 2019, there has been significant increase in cost and com uh, combined costs, as in stair lifts, ramps door adaptations and the average cost has actually gone to around 13,500. So this is a re revised policy now reflects on the current uh, price increase and we've increased it to 15,000 for a fast track grant. The policy oil allows for discretionary grants enabling to, for adaptations for up to 15,000 or less to be provided without means testing. This will allow more people to manage their health um, and live independently in their own home and communities. I'm happy to take this policy for approval by the Cabinet. Thank you very much. There are questions? Councillor Carter. Uh, yeah, uh, could you tell me what difference this will make to Harlow families in need? This will make significant um, um, difference to um, families in need in the sense that it will be fast track the actual grants and actually prior to um, this change um, we already had the, fa the fact that um, we meet the that it was becoming the cost was greater than the, the ten thousand pound cap so that meant that it some of them got rejected or we couldn't fulfill all the adaptations. So this will have a greater impact. And again, for the, the fact that it has a, a, a well-being um, for people to be able to stay in their own homes and less intervention from the likes of the N NHS and so forth. Um, could you tell me how much the council gives out in grant funding for this type of thing in a year? We've just got shy of just under a million pound um, a year, so uh, 905627. Uh, Councillor Sanders, do you have a question? Sorry, I thought you did. Yeah. No? Okay, Councillor Evans. Yeah. I think following up possibly on uh, Councillor Carter's uh, last question, I just wanted to be clear. Uh, in terms of the overall AIDS and adaptions budget, will this have any implications for that? AIDS and adaptions budget because I understand that the AIDS and adaptions budget was reduced um, a couple of years ago, um, which has had some, some which had some impact on the ability of the council to um, sort of, um, adapt, adapt, adapt housing etc. And, and schemes were being held back. Um, so I'm just I just want to just want to be clear in terms. of and, and you know, and, and, and as the AIDS and adaptation budget being looked at in the context of this, just no, just clarify that um, obviously the two two separate things. So this is about um, private sector housing, government grant funding, AIDS and adaptations. Obviously, the, the budget you're referring to is about council properties, uh, which I think was sat at about eight hundred thousand yeah, or so yeah, for the last yeah. few years, and every year without fail was. You know, dramatically, uh, you know, a significant amount of pressure on that. So obviously, it'll be reviewed um, in the budget process. Um, although I think I'm right in saying that funding is also largely from grant um, as well, which is you know, that's why it probably hasn't increased um, accordingly. But two, you know, one for council housing, one for private housing, with anything more than that. Councillor Seals, anything else? 
much. There, any comments? There, back to you, Kat. Um, for me, this is really important, and, and for officers as well, was the fact that we wanted to be able to, to give these grants out um, to people in need that needed adaptations to their homes, um, and the fact that we could actually give them better care and stay at home. I think it's really um, important that we differentiate between the council owned homes and the, the private um, home ownership, ownership. But for me, it's so important that people can have stair lifts, can have ramps, and actually stay at home. So, this is the most important thing. Yeah, thank you. And ju just to add, I think the, the benefits of the proposed new policy are twofold. One, that it will significantly reduce the bureaucracy that people face um, when they're in the position you're out on. And two is that uh, more people will be able to get the facilities that they need as a result of the change to the camp. Uh, and that can only be, you know, for the people that need this, it, this is genuinely life-changing stuff. Um, and, and therefore, I'm sure as well, I'd like to. On that note, our yeah. recommendations A and B agreed by the cabinet. Yeah, and again, particular thanks um, to to the officers involved in this. This is no small piece of work, and as I say, will make a dramatic difference to to people's lives. Uh, which takes us on to item 18, questions, procedures, pages 139 to 146. Councillor Lepar, are you enough? Yeah, and I'll second that. Do you want to introduce the item? Yes, um, just pop the microphone. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, um, this this um, should not be seen as, as an attempt at censorship. Uh, since in, two, in 2017, there were 14 questions to Cabinet and full Council. That increased to 113 in 2022. Um, we have time limits in place for this. Nevertheless, the workload on for officers has increased substantially, and also, um, so th this this um, measure is proposed to limit the, the size of questions down to 200 words, and maximum 300 words for an answer. We should also and, and to increase the the t t term for submitting questions, increasing it from two days the three business days uh, with questions being submitted at a deadline of midday. Um, I was going to add that the idea is that the councillors' questions should be deemed as being read unless specifically requested otherwise. Same with the answers being specifically uh, taken as read. This is to give more time to the public who don't have the same access to information which all councillors and members do and um, it's, it's basically a practical uh, proposal uh, to make better use of the time and uh, I recommend that we go forward with it. Yeah and, and again it's a complex piece of work to strike the balance between uh, you know, open question scrutiny and uh, efficiency of council meetings and I think the balance is the right one to strike with the word limits. Um, it's obviously not the case that councillors can't ask questions, it's just that the substantive is taken as read and then supplementaries can be asked accordingly. Um, but again, um, you know, commend the government's team, uh, particularly the senior government officer, uh, I'll save his blushes uh, by not naming him, but uh, I know he's left this piece of work and it's, it's really important. So, uh, over to questions, which is which is not playing words. You don't have to take this one as read. Yes, thank you very much, Chair. Um, one, <laughs> I don't know how long I'd be given. Um, maybe I should write out my question and submit it. Um, one of the items suggested here seems seems quite sensible, really. That's uh, B, if it is the case that officers are struggling to prepare the answers, then okay, maybe a few more hours wouldn't do any harm. However, I am worried about what looks like an attempt to shut us up. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
Most local authorities are in the business of encouraging, encouraging questions and answers, whether from members of the public or from councillors, and generally speaking, they can't really get enough of either. So this looks like a way of stifling questions, a way of controlling any challenge that those questions might represent. It is not a healthy suggestion, definitely not. So I am very disappointed, Councillor Leopard. Just to clarify, sorry Kay, that we're, we're wrong questions. A particularly short and punchy question would be well. Put your microphone on as well. Sorry, my apologies. Are you in the business, um, Councillor Leopard, um, of trying to shut up questioning, challenge the sort of open, healthy challenge that any local authority should welcome? Just, just before we come to Councillor Leopard, there's a couple of things I'll point out. One is that. Uh, the changing to the time that's proposed to clarify what that means is opposed to a Monday evening at 5 o'clock, it's a Friday before a meeting at 12 o'clock. Uh, if, if any member uh, had any questions they wished to raise after that point, there is a standing order in place that means that they could raise them without notice uh, accordingly at the discretion of the chair, particularly on urgent matters for instance, um, or in uh, the usual business of the meeting um, accordingly. So actually there is no proposal here to uh, reduce the number of questions you can ask. There's no proposal here to uh, control anyone in any means. What there's a proposal to do uh, is to make more efficient use of the time. So um, in terms of the word limits, it's supposed to be a question. It's not a statement and 200 words is quite a generous um, question. It's a pretty big paragraph. That's not um, any sort of form of control. And actually there's no limit on the supplementary question either. So you said about challenge, uh, you can still ask the question and you can still ask a supplementary to challenge the question. Um, but it's not the only form a member can do so. There's no, um, no limit uh, or no proposed change to limits in terms of members of the public. Uh, and actually the proposal is to encourage more members of the public to ask questions because there's more time spent on their questions as opposed to members who, um, frankly, uh, you, you may use questions to draw attention to a topic that you may not be gaining enough traction on or you may use them to make a political point which, you know, for information you could gather in alternative means. Um, so I, I really reject the, the notion um, that you make. But Councillor Leppard, I believe you're charged with the controlling tactics. <laughs> <laughs> well, well uh, I, I don't know what the problem is, perhaps we can have a look, but... Um, in terms of, 
Okay, you've got a fluff on that. <laughs> it's, it's <laughs> In, in terms of the deadline submitting questions being moved forwards, it's probably not a bad thing to give officers a chance to actually um, uh, answer the questions with enough time. Um, with these changes, I know that it's not necessarily increasing it by a lot of time. Does it then give us the opportunity to provide those who have asked the question the answers to those questions earlier? To then provide a supplementary. Yeah, I, I'll get the point make it. Um, so, I think off the top of my head, standing orders does say something about when uh, the, the answers are published. Um, I think what it will do is allow a better answer, without a doubt, and particularly for anyone that's been a portfolio holder, um, particularly if you work by a lot of um, when answers are prepared, if there's a very short window of time, it can be quite hard to you know, get to the right answer, because you might not see it the same day it needs to be published. Um, so I think that and it's not the, the new back end process is also in how uh, the actual question is, is pro, you know, it's not just picking around on email, it's actually a process um, for everyone. But I don't think there's any proposal to change, you know, when someone would get the answer, as it were. Um, it's certainly important to have, have a look at it. Yeah, so <coughs> I'd say if there were. No, <coughs> if this is accepted tonight, does it work? Did it go then as a it goes as a recommendation to full council? Yes. Would it be discussed at full council? Yes. So the so the, the, the full I council to like make it. a decision. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it is, it is a change to the constitution. Yeah. Therefore, it has to follow the procedure for any changes to constitution. Yes. Full, full, yes. 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 full yeah. debate. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Any further questions? No, any comments? I'll, I'll be very brief, Chair. I'm sure you'll recognise the sense of irony that it's nearly half past ten and this is a meeting where we only had two questions from councillors and they were very, very short. Um, look, I do understand why this has come about, but I think we've got to be very careful not to limit um, the opportunity that of, of members of public have to ask questions. Yeah. And in fact, I think something that hasn't been mentioned necessarily in this debate is actually we should really welcome the fact that we get a lot of questions from the public. Mm -hmm. Now, quite often people come with questions to this chamber because they've got an issue that they want to raise with us. But actually, it's good that we're a council where that happens. And I think we should really, really welcome um, the public's participation. I cited Screamy Councillor uh, Leopard, and you've probably mentioned this before, about um, uh, councils having um, uh, more opportunity to, to access information. You won't be surprised to know that some of the questions I ask, I know the answer to. But I think it's really important that they're asked in a public format like this, particularly now we've got, well, we haven't got technology, but we will have the technology, because actually it's important that we do ask those questions publicly. So I would just like to disagree with you on that. And my little re cheeky request is perhaps if we're looking at the time that questions are submitted, perhaps we can look at um, a, a deadline for uh, written amendments to motions, perhaps. Uh, sometimes they do come a little bit last minute. Any further comments? I didn't think we were limiting questions from the public. No, the, yeah, so if there's no further comments, um, just clarify. There's no limits or proposed limits or new limits or anything in between on questions from the public. Um, in fact, it's hoping to encourage more of that. And I totally agree, you know, actually, when you look at a lot of councils, they have a very different approach to questions from the public and um, accordingly. Of course, in terms of, you mentioned about councils asking, you know, putting on, you know, the public record, particularly important issues, that would just be the discretion of the chair. So, down to your uh, negotiating ability to plead with the importance. Yeah. As, as if, if, um, if you make your way to Parliament, you'll find out what happens there every day. Um, yeah, I know. Uh, there was one other point. Oh, yes, about uh, motions. Well, of course, it could be the case that someone could propose an amendment to a motion during the meeting, um, having listened to your uh, reason for, for putting the motion. Uh, so I don't think there'll be any changes to that. But, um, Worth a try, though. Yeah, no, there being no further comments, recommendation A to D on item 18, is that agreed? Agreed. Yes, yeah, so that's referred to, to full council um, on the matter, which brings us to item 19, uh, community, sorry? Yeah, yeah, referral from licensing uh, committee, Hackney carriage tariffs. I don't know if there's anything specific you want to say. Right. 
can't. We can't anyway. Can't. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's nothing really particular you want to say. Obviously, it's, um, in terms of hackney carriage, the taxi drivers <coughs> welcome this. Um, but this was taken um, through. Um, they've actually wor- welcomed it, and when you actually read the report and you see, um, when you actually look where the position chart is, that we're nine, uh, 90th compared to yeah. some of them that are a lot worse off, you know, 326. Um, I just think it's a welcome thing. Yeah, and a lot of work has gone into it, obviously, an awful lot of benchmark. It's been through licensing to referral here. Uh, I speak with uh, tax and private hire drivers uh, what seems like every single day. Uh, I very much welcome that. Um, and they are certainly welcoming of, of the proposal, particularly the implementation leading up to the Christmas period uh, that's proposed, I think, is overdue. And it's a difficult balance to strike between um, you know, the, the cost to residents of using the service, but also to the uh, drivers um, making a living. And I think this is a, a fair way of doing that. So um, <coughs> are there any questions on this? No? Any comments? No, okay, so our recommendations A and B agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Very good. Uh, which brings us to item 20 minutes of panels uh, and working groups, which I propose to take on block. Um, they are just for noting, but I think Councillor Carter, you had something you wanted to raise quickly. Yeah, just quick. Oh, it's not there, right. Um, on page 179 of the Harlow uh, Local Highways panel, um, it said there, Councillor David Carter confirmed that 10 sets of red lines would be installed to stop lorries over three tonnes from parking on the street. This was in Kingsmoor Road. The parking partnership changed the rules. <coughs> they don't now use red lines. They use signs, and the signs are at both ends of Kingsmoor Road, and they're on the lampposts all the way down either <coughs> side of the road. So it's a change from there. In that, it also said it was to stop lorries from over three tons. It's actually three and a half tons. They're the notices that are up, not the lines. They're up now and they're working. And lorries that were parking there were fined and they're now not parking there anymore and the road's quite clear. Uh, well, the amendment to the minutes will be a matter for the local highways panel yeah, at the next absolutely. meeting, so uh, by all means raise it there, but I'm sure we'll be <coughs> to hear about the success of the scheme in King's um, Are there any other points to note? Obviously, if there are any changes required, it's for the relevant body <coughs> Very quickly, as well, just very quickly, I, I think we, 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 as a council, we could look to replicate what's been done uh, on the King's Moor Road across other roads within Harlow. I mean, we, we frequently, on, for example, on Mongol Road, have a yeah. Sure. yeah, very, absolutely. Uh, and it's a matter for uh, the parking partnership and local islands, mainly the parking partnership through TROs. But um, on that point, uh, are those minutes noted? They are. That's very business. There are none to the meeting. It certainly doesn't close at half six. Uh, half ten. Ten twenty-eight. Ten twenty-eight. Yeah, well,